Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship. Um, I was just thinking as the band were playing that, and I was watching the timpanist, and, uh, and I was thinking about a moment, forgive me, band, um, that, that I, I watched a video quite recently of um, the Black Dyke Band playing a Salvation Army piece called To Boldly Go. And it has, in the middle of that, it has a section that's pretty much as quiet as you can possibly play. And the effect of that pianissimo in that performance was absolutely breathtaking. And then I, I, I like to link things together. And for me, everything roots back to Jesus. Everything. In him we live and move and have our being. So, so then I was thinking, well, more grace is wrought in quietness than any is aware. And then I was thinking about my own discipline of being still and silent, often. And then I was thinking about my leaning towards naturally being quite loud and noisy. And how my discipline to be breathtakingly pianissimo is, has to be that. I have to make it happen. And so as we gather for worship, I don't know how, you, how you've arrived this morning. I don't know whether you've arrived fortissimo or pianissimo. I'm looking at you. Or just a fairly bland mezzo forte. Uh, um, but when we arrive for worship, it's important that we have arrived that we don't just kind of rock up and expect, in this morning's case, expect me to do all the work for you, to serve it on a plate with gravy on it already, ready to go. We're here. The Salvation Army's language is very deliberate. We have meetings. We don't have services. And we meet together around the cross of Christ. And I've said it a million times. The only thing that's strong enough to unite us in any purpose as a community of believers is Christ. Anything else will not only not unite us, but will actually pull us apart. So I would like you to stand and we're going to make a prayer together. Lorraine and I came across this prayer written by that person who's written a lot of things called Anon. I don't know who Anon is, but, but we, we came across Anon's prayer. And, um, and over the years, we've used it. Um, at moments when it felt very necessary, and maybe that's every week. So we're going to make this prayer together because it's important that we get the balance right of being a completely open door to the cross of Christ but also understanding what makes us community, why we've gathered at all. So let's pray this prayer together. We're going to read it out loud and we're going to read it not in a muttering, mumbling I can't really be bothered mezzo forte sort of a way. We're going to read it in a good, confident intentional way. So let's pray together. Dear God our Father we pray the doors of this church wide enough to welcome all who need human love, fellowship, and a father's care, but narrow enough to shut out all envy, pride, and lack of love. Here may the tempted find help, the sorrowing receive comfort, and the regretful be assured of your forgiveness. And here, may all your people renew their strength and leave through these doors in hope and joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we gather before a faithful God. The band are going to help us. We're going to just sing this very simple... Stay standing or sit down, it's up to you. But we're going to sing this very simple set of words a couple of times. 
In the context of that prayer we've just made, we gather before a faithful God who is peace. And we're going to explore deeply what it means to gather around a shalom God of peace. So band, please help us as we sing Faithful God. Psalm 103 says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Father God, we gather together your people in, you, in this community of faith and we just thank you that we can freely come together around your salvation work for us and god may your holy spirit open our ears this morning open our hearts so that we may have the ears to hear and the hearts to receive your love your compassion your forgiveness your correction this morning as we come together in your community amen i mean now stay standing but just for one verse unless you want to sit down if your legs are giving way, they don't fall over. Um, we're going to sing um, one. Ver we're going to sing what my favourite of the kind of old school hymns: "Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation." Um, and and I just want to kind of go through this in a prayerful way, but strong and prayerful. So we'll sing it as we would normally do it, with kind of 
whatever that is. And we'll sing that. And, and, uh, and then we're just going to pause after that each verse. Um, Andrew, if that's all right. And uh, uh, so we'll sing the first verse, and then you can sit down. Unless you want to stay standing up, then that is absolutely fine. But you will look a bit weird if everyone else is sitting down. But that's fine if you want to look weird, because that's my life. There we are. Right, OK, thank you. So sit down, and I just want to pause on those last couple of lines there. <laughs> All ye who hear brothers and sisters draw near, praise him in glad adoration. I want us to be very aware that our conduct and the context of where we lift our praises is an invitation to everyone who hears and sees to come to the God that you worship. Our worship is witness, to put that in a concise sentence. And what that also means is that the negative is also true. So if your depiction of the God you worship is in some way off centre, then the invitation to your God that you're worshipping is not where it should be. So. So that's both challenge and encouragement. So all you who hear, so anyone that can, so, sorry guys, you can hear my praises where you're sitting. Even if your worship is, you're, you're singing, sorry, your singing is pretty poor, the way that you lift your praises to your God, the, the one to whom your life has purpose and meaning, then this verse of invitation that we've lifted up already is our witness. Okay, next one. <laughs> I've spoken about this before. This couple of lines catches my attention whenever I sing this. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. This idea of blowing away our own restrictions of the God that we worship, our own definitions, our own assessment of what is possible. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. I don't know how mighty your God is. What's your view of God? You know, we're going to mention this later on, but I'll, I'll kind of give you a taster. Um, Anselm said that God is that than which nothing greater can be thought. And now that, that definition in itself is restrictive, but the idea that we can somehow summarise God in our definitions, in our, our own thinking, our own theology, our own decision to proceed... It needs a constant pondering anew. So, so the invitation that, that worship as witness comes with it, actually, how big is the God that we worship? Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. Okay, next two verses, please, Andrew. <laughs>
so these two verses are a beautiful depiction of the unanswerable questions. They're the, the, the posing of the questions that none of us have an answer to. The idea of, well, why are there storms around me? Why is there suffering? Why is the bad people seem to succeed in their ways? And the answer to our first two verses, the idea of blowing God, our restrictions of God out the water, are really the answers that we seek in these two verses. The fact that God is almighty and that we do need a constant pondering of how amazing and great he is leads us to a place of being comfortable with the mystery of not having the answer to every question. Uh, Nathan um, put up a, a really good video which I shared on the uh, core Facebook page. Um, if you, you may have seen it. This idea of, of the unanswerable questions, the difficulty of pain as C.S. Lewis uh, titled his book. Um, so I encourage you, if you're in a place this morning where you have the unanswerable questions with many whys attached to them, to return to verses one and two and to be okay with the fact that Jesus does calm the storm, but in his time. He calms us. He was asleep until he was ready to wake up, if you remember, in the boat, and the disciples panicked. Let's sing verse 5. <laughs> is a circular notion, how we've gone through the journey of declaring God's greatness and in, an invitation and a challenge that our worship is witness that requires a constant renewal pondering of God's greatness and all that he can do. Through the difficulties and the mystery of life so that our amen can sound again and become our worship as witness again. So it's this constant cyclical process. It's never a once and for all end of the story, is it? Jesus, we thank you that the depths of who you are will never be reached, no matter how much we ponder and how much we seek. Jesus, we bow before your mystery this morning. And as we bring our questions, as we bring our honest confounding, endless questions. Jesus, may we submit and find your love and your grace is all that we need this morning. Amen. Amen. And let the amen sound from his people again. That's pretty rubbish, isn't it? Amen. Nah, still rubbish. Right, once more. Amen. Yeah, okay. Six out of ten. We'll go for seven next time. Right, okay. Um, I'm going to read it because it just means I don't... Hey, June Parish was a hundred yesterday. <laughs> that is amazing. It's great that June's with us this morning. She's got uh, family around her. There was a, a lovely uh, celebration of family and friends yesterday. Um, a lovely meal, and, uh, and congratulations. It sounds really patronising, congratulations for reaching 100. But you know what? It's, and it struck me, June, that you could be one of the last people to get a telegram from the Queen. 
I was, I was thinking about some of, some of us here, if we, we get the privilege of reaching 100, it could be a telegram from the king. So there we are. So, so. Congratulations, and uh, to celebrate with all of us, there is cake after the meeting. Hallelujah to cake. Do you know, you said hallelujah more readily about cake than you did about look, look, trying to get you to say amen just now. Fair enough. Okay, um, and also the band, are, or a, a small group from the band, are going to the Lindens um, straight after the meeting. Uh, not just to play to Betty Everest, but Betty Everest will be there, and um, that's where she lives, and uh, the residents there. Um, if they mention a crocheting pattern, that's my fault, because I've just remembered I was going to take, there's a, a, a knitting group that were knitting when I went last time, and I, I said I would take them a pattern. <laughs> and I've just remembered that, and that was a few weeks ago. So they're probably cross with me. Where's that man with the patterns? OK, the band are going to play uh, Dance Like David. Now, um, Andrew and I were discussing this, and I'm not to quote him at all on any of this, he said. So, so this is a piece called Dance Like David, and I, I thought I would look up the, the scripture passage this is based on, 2 Samuel 6. Um, and this is a moment when David was so full of the joy of the Lord that he danced in his priestly garments. So David and all the people of Israel brought, the ark, brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and a blowing of ram's horns. And, and this is the bit that, that uh, uh, we're not quoting anyone on. But as it, so you can enter into it. You can feel free to. You, there's two parts you can play. You can either be David dancing with abandonment in your priestly garbs. Or you can be like Michal, the daughter of Saul, who looked down from her window and she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord and she was filled with contempt for him. So you can either be somebody who's dancing while the band's playing or you can be someone filled with contempt at the people that are dancing and be cross. So it's up to you. The band are going to play dance like David. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, band. It's good, isn't it? Do you like that? Yeah, I like that. I like that. We are going... Sorry. <clears throat> I often used to think... I'm so glad I don't have to talk after I've been playing a brass instrument. But here I am, having to talk after playing a brass instrument. It never really works out that well. Um, we are going to take up the offering just now, which is a continuation of worship. It is not half-time. Um, so we will worship God with our giving. And uh, we will also sing at the same time, Jesus, what a beautiful name, which we'll, uh, we have a backing track for. And whilst that's going on, the uh, children will go out for Sunday school. So all at the same time, three things, we will worship God in three different ways. Mm. each day and so we respond with this offering praying it will be acceptable and blessed in sharing your love amen thank you for your giving thank you david 
was thinking about you actually when we, the band were playing Dance Like David. David. Okay, um, Judges chapter 6 is on the uh, screen there. Now, I've been thinking about Bible readings in worship. Sometimes we can be, I can be guilty of redacting down to just the verses I want to talk about, which uh, is inherently dangerous, ripping out verses out of context. Um, and so, oh, it says 6 to 24. That should be 1 to 24. So just to help you there. Um, but, but, but then when we get to a longer Bible reading, uh, for those who are, whose attention span is that of a hamster, they, they struggle and they drift off into what, what the chicken's doing at the moment in the oven. And, and the only answer to that I've got for you, really, is we need scripture in context. So we're talking about Gideon this morning and understanding the context of Gideon and Jehovah Shalom, uh, the Lord is peace, and understanding how we get to that point, we need a longer section of Judges chapter 6 to 24. Um, so we, we are, um, so my answer is get a Bible and look at it while I'm reading it. That's all I've got. That's my answer to your, your concentration woes. It's on the screen, but if it helps to focus your attention, then there's a shelf full behind Colonel Keith. Okay, and, and Fiona will give anyone in, a, in the room a Bible who needs one. I've, I've just volunteered you for that, yeah. Sure. Okay, so um, Judges 6, verses 1 to 24, we'll go through it. Um, you will notice as we go through it on the screen that I have um, underlined... The, the verses that we are going to kind of zoom in on and, and take, take as our kind of direction this morning. But um, so here we are, the, the full reading, 6, 1 to 24. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern people invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the hand of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah, that belonged to Joash the Abizirite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in, strength you go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But the Lord... But Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. 
the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Gideon replied, If now I have found favour in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait till you return. Gideon went in, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah, <coughs> a, flour, a flour, he made bread with yeast, put in the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot. He brought them out and offered them to, to him under the oak. The angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. With the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realised that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, here it comes, the Lord is peace. Jehovah Shalom. To this day it stands in offer of the Abizarites. We will sing. Here is love, vast as the ocean, love in kindness as the flood, when the Prince of Life our ransom shed for us his precious blood. And our task this morning is to look in this ancient story from the depths of the Old Testament and link it to our current experience of Christ today. So thank you, Dan. <laughs> And if you'd like to come and sit downstairs, um, you can relax. Well, I might need some participation in a minute, but um, that'd be good. So it's always important, really, for us 21st century Christians to make very deliberate um, journeys of faith and thought through these ancient Old Testament narratives um, through the context of Christ that we now have and also the context of 21st century culture that we live in. Otherwise, they're just stories from long ago. The story of Gideon is just a story of someone from long ago. So we need to make those very deliberate um, connections. So... Um, we will attempt to do that this morning between us, um, if that's okay. So I'll, I might need some participation as visual aids. 
Um, I might need some angry looking people. And I might, I might need a, a holy looking person. <laughs> and I might, so, might need someone that feels like they're the least in their household, the least important. So I'll let you decide. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we all feel sorry for ourselves in that way sometimes, don't we? So, um, so let's just kind of get, get a bit of kind of, uh, if you like, technical uh, context around this idea of Jehovah Shalom. So the other week we looked at Jehovah Jireh, God provides, um, which I thank those that have uh, fed back and, and said how appreciative they were of that. It's always nice to get some positive feedback. Just saying. <laughs> just saying. Um, so Shalom. Um, is a now uh, is a Jewish greeting and, and is an extension of the daily Shema, uh, which I think I've got here, Lorraine. Um, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So, so in Jewish households, when they gather together, uh, 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 Shalom, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So, and the Shema, um, it, it, it's this kind of daily utterance of the centrality of Yahweh uh, within the life, the nationhood of Israel. So, so and, and, and Shalom is an extension of that uh, as they greet each other. And we've got a video to illustrate that. Some might have seen this TV series. Shalom, Shalom. Yes, of course, Sh Shalom. Shalom, Jackie. Um, shalom, Shalom. 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 I'm looking around at your faces. Some of you have seen that and some of you haven't. Um, it's called Friday Night Dinner. Uh, I don't know whether to recommend it or not. Uh, maybe, maybe. Um, uh, I've only seen bits of it, so maybe I shouldn't recommend it until I've seen all of it, Benjamin. Okay, so... Um, so uh, and then, so, so that's the, the, where Shalom finds its way into current uh, Jewishness. Um, uh, Jehovah... Uh, as we explored with Jehovah Jireh, is the concept of God. Uh, we see this as a name of God, but particularly uh, to the ancient nation of Israel, Jehovah is, uh, uh, was uh, the way in which the holy God of the universe was brought to their consciousness without them constraining their view of him by a name. So they felt that his name could never be uttered, uh, as we said a couple of weeks ago with Jehovah Jireh, and so the idea of... Uh, Jehovah is the, uh, literally the, the, the idea, the concept of who God is to them as a nation. The closest Christian idea of this, as I, uh, I, I alluded to earlier, is Anselm's description of God as that than which nothing greater can be thought. So the idea that as soon as you uh, put a definition or you put something around God uh, as a way of your, uh, summing him up in your understanding, uh, well, he's He's greater than that. He, he's beyond our summary. Um, the name Jehovah conveys the thought of being or existing or becoming known, while the term shalom refers to soundness, completeness, harmony, and the absence of strife. It is best rendered by our English word peace, so hence we have the Lord is peace. And this particular juncture, Israel was oppressed by the Midianites, who left them hiding in caves, bereft of food, livestock, and working tools. With terror in their hearts and aware of their weaknesses, they cried to God for help. He reminded them that their disobedience caused their troubles, but he also sent them Gideon. So for me, as I looked at this idea of Jehovah Shalom in the context of this community of faith because we must apply it and put it before us as God's people, us as Peterborough Citadel. We must put this scripture before us. I look at it in the context of where we are now. And, and, and so, so I, I saw here that he's a, a, a nation crushed by their fear of defeat by their enemies. So they felt crushed and defeated so they could do nothing. So on the one hand, they have that fear over there. And on the other side, they have this fear of being inadequate, 
both in the face of a holy God, but also inad inadequate in face of achieving any kind of flourishing from where they are. And within that kind of, those two stereo fears going on, God says, I am peace. And it struck me as I read this scripture that I've read before, and I know the story of Gideon, that within the context of conflict, there in the middle is the God of peace. And if anything, we have more hope of finding Jehovah Shalom within the feeling of crushed by our enemies and inadequate to the task. So if you're feeling either of those things, my encouragement to you this morning is you're probably in a good place to discover the real depth of Jehovah Shalom. So I encourage you to dig deeply this morning into that. So I need a group of angry looking people, please. Just three or four, uh, but uh, it needs to be somebody that can stand up for a few minutes just so you're, you're a, a persistent visual aid. So I, I will pick you if you don't jump up, but um, I've, you've got five seconds to volunteer and then I'm just gonna pick four people. Five, four, three, two. Right, uh, Ian and Chizzy, you're, you're angry. Benjamin and Chris, if you don't mind, just come and stand here. Uh, just there, that's good. And then I just need a, I need a Gideon as an illustrative. Uh, Max, you put your hand up for being, um, being, feeling like you're the least in your house, so you can come, come and stand here. Of course, that's obviously not true, but Max was being facetious, but I, I will... Uh, so, Max, you, you just need to look serene and neutral. <laughs> but face everyone else. I don't know what serene and neutral looks like, but you can be it this morning. Max is the definition of those two words. Right, you guys, you need to kind of bear over Max. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I chose badly here. Yeah, that, that'll do. That's fine. But, but just strike a pose of anger and oppression that you can hold for a few minutes, all right? Yeah, that, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah, Chris, Chris, you look the most intimidating of us all, actually. <laughs> Great stuff. So, so the, word, the verse that kind of comes with this bit is, uh, Lorraine, if you can just jump on. It's verse 6 in, in chapter 6 of Judges. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. It's this idea of absolute desperation that we feel like we're completely crushed and oppressed by those around us. And the picture that I've got there, I, I put in Google Images, bullying. And, and apologies, uh, because when I looked at that, it, it actually made me feel quite sad. Because for those that are fami familiar with a school context, that's a reality within a community of immature human beings is this bullying, but it's also a reality in the adult, keep striking that pose, guys. It's also a reality in, in adult life, isn't it, that there are those who set themselves as your enemy, that they will, they will surround you in an intimidating way, and you feel like you're serene and neutral, like Max is defining for us this morning, yet seemingly inexplicably, we have this, this surrounding feeling of being defeated by our enemies, that we want to just give up, we want to walk away, we don't or can't do it anymore. The feeling of being crushed, so impoverished, feeling so bereft of answers, so devoid of resources to stand up, that we, in our serene, neutral place, feel we are absolutely crushed. Uh, angry people, if I can ask you to just kind of be, be that side, just so we can put some here. So uh, I now need a, an extremely holy looking person. Marilyn Crake, you're, you're unbelievably holy. So, so come, and, come and stand here and just look lovingly at Max. No, you're serene and neutral. You're not embracing her. Unbelievable. So, 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 so Marilyn is our picture of, 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 of 
holiness. Now, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? So, so we have, having the, the context of the Jewish nation, uh, here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, have no other gods before me. Mark one of our ten marks of wonderful church is, is that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul and mind. That our whole lives are absolutely engulfed in this love for God. And that love looks like something and we express that in a way. And just, but here we have Gideon looking serene and neutral and surrounded by the defeat of his enemies, feeling bereft of resources. And one of the, co- the consequences of being crushed by, or feeling of being crushed by our enemies, is that when we look to the solution, which in the context of Israel is always God, and is always the might of God that God can overcome, is that we can feel absolutely inadequate to the task. That in the face of God's holiness, and in the face of the answer, and we look at people who seem to have it all sorted, people that are beautiful and and serene and holy, and we think, I wish I could just be a bit like that, even for five minutes in the day, for goodness sake. We have those two extremes, crushed by our enemies, and a feeling of inadequacy. Uh, The verse to illustrate that, verses 14 and 15, when the angel of the Lord says to Gideon, go in the strength you have and save Israel. Go in the strength you have. So we can be guilty. Oh, sorry, I just discovered that word. Can you go back to that word? I like that. A telephobia. A telephobia. The fear of not being good enough. You're not looking angry enough, guys. Keep looking angry. The, The fear of not being... Sorry, I've just told you you're not good enough at being angry. The fear of not being good enough... A telephobia, and, and yeah, then the verses, um, Lorraine, there we are. So go, go in the strength of the Lord you have. So here we have someone who feels crushed by and bereft of resources, looking on to the solution, knowing that God is the answer. But then God says, well, you're not bereft of resources. You've got all the stuff you need right in front of you. Everything you need, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of... Midian's hand, the aggression that is crushing you. But Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? Hang on, the Lord's just said, go in the strength you have, and there's an argument going on immediately. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. Serene and neutral. The angel of the Lord says, God will do it. The angel of the Lord says, I will deliver Midian into your hands by my strength. Crushed by and defeated by, leaving a feeling of bereft of resources to the task. The picture of the solution of holiness, of living like Christ, of being like God, knowing God is the answer, but I cannot do it. And the answer comes back to him. You have the strength. Go in the strength that you already have. You can sit down, folks, because I, I fear I might have to give you... No, you can sit down. We well, can sit there if you want to, but don't. So, so six, uh, verse 623 says, So Gideon built an altar there and called it, The Lord is Peace. Jehovah Shalom. And it strikes me that within those two opposing, crushing feelings, he found the peace. And he built an altar. And in Old Testament um, narrative, we, we see that time and again, that people mark the place at which they proceed in the strength of the Lord from. And so it strikes me that Like I said, we lay this before us as a community of of believers. That we, we could say that in our fellowship, we have two sides of the same argument feeling similar things. We have, on the one hand, those that feel defeated by the state of the church in the 21st century. We feel that. We feel crushed by it. We feel 
uh, frustrated, devoid of resources. We've run out of answers. We don't know what we're going to do next. In fact, why do anything next? We'll hide in a cave. Let's find one and get in there quick and shut the door. Because if we try and do anything, if we plant any crops, then the Midianites will just come and rip them up and take them away. Such is their weight of numbers. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're thinking, well, I'll just kind of tread water for the rest of my days and hope that there's enough left life in this old dog yet to get me to the end. Crushed. And then there are others who know the answer is discipleship. They know the answer is mission. They know the answer is to be like Christ, to be the body of Christ, to uh, see the church being an absolute representation of the kingdom of God in this world. They know that but feel absolutely inadequate to get to it. To the point where, why bother? I can't get there. We're not in a fit state to get there. So why bother? And we have those two things going on. I would suggest in our fellowship. And so that filled me with encouragement when I read this in the context of my recent reflections on where we are as a church. What, what on earth are you talking about? Why? Because into that context, the angel of the Lord said, I am the God of peace. Go in the strength you have and save Israel. Go in the strength you have. Do you know, um, Alan Hirsch is a great, writer on all things mission, focusing very much on Ephesians chapter 4 and the, the idea of um, the, the, the body of Christ containing all that it needs. And he postulates that, 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 that wherever the body of Christ is present, we have all the resources we need to succeed for the kingdom of heaven. And so that blows out the water, this idea that we haven't got anything we need. And it also blows out the water that the kingdom of heaven is a victorious kingdom. So it blows out the water the idea that we are crushed and devoid of resources. Go in the strength you have. So, I say it again, I think I said it last week. Look around you. Look in the mirror. The body of Christ is a victorious body of Christ. In this age... And we go in the strength we have. Not in the strength we think we need, but in the strength that we have. The body of Christ is victorious. Gideon was caught between the fear of defeat and destruction from the Midianites and the fear of his own weakness and sinfulness before a holy God. And that's the last bit of the puzzle I think we probably need to address because we're not very good at that in the Salvation Army. The Anglican liturgy covers that every week. Because the reading begins, and the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. No, sorry, again. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And we have to be prepared as the community of believers that there is a need for corporate confession. We have to be prepared that the reason for our plight is no one else's fault except for our own. And that requires a posture of submission. Because actually all things kingdom of heaven are accessed by a posture of submission. And whether that's an individual confession or a corporate one, the answer to our feeling of crushed or inadequacy is actually confession. Jehovah Shalom is found there. Jehovah Shalom is found between crushed by enemies, inadequate, and it's found in confession. 
What is peace? What is it to be in the peace of Jehovah Shalom? Is it the absence of conflict and turmoil? No. No. That's never been promised, has it? Jesus said, and just before he was crucified, um, you will have trouble in this world, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So no, it's not absence of conflict and turmoil. We already sung that in the praise to the Lord the Almighty. Or is it knowing that even within this conflict and turmoil, that we're in right now, let's be honest about it, God's purposes are being done. He is with us, with me. And he will get us, me, through. Jehovah Shalom is found in that place. Jesus, you, you are the one who is omnipresent in our turmoil. When our understanding runs out, Jesus, you are there. When our understanding and our feeling of strength has gone, you are there. Jesus, your kingdom comes when we confess our sin before you. Holy Spirit, as a community of believers, we have to submit to you. We have to hear you. We need your help to pull out the stoppers from our ears. So we pray you will open the eyes of our hearts to see that you are here, that your kingdom can flourish, that we can defeat that which crushes us, that we can be a beautiful demonstration of all that the kingdom of heaven is in this city in this age, Jesus, may we flourish in you as we acknowledge you are here. The songsters are going to sing by way of response for all of us. Jesus will still be there. Jesus will still be there. What? Why? Because he was always there. His presence has never been questioned. Next week, we're going to look at Jehovah Shammah. God is there. So let's just be blessed as the songs just sing these words over us. And we respond and maybe even confess our need to claim that shalom peace right now in this fellowship in order that we can flourish before God.
Isn't that the best reassurance? Isn't that the best reassurance? Regardless of where we feel like we are, Jesus, the same Jesus, is there. Jehovah Shalom resides among us. And he declares that in amidst the turmoils. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your omnipresence, for always being there. We thank you, Lord, that no matter where we go, which cave we choose to hide in, or which enemy we run from, you are there. And may we go in the strength that we have for the sake of the people who are yet to know you. Because you are sending us, O oh Lord. No matter how weak we find our clan to be. No matter how insignificant we think we are within it. May we discover and build our altar from which to proceed, called Jehovah Shalom. Let's stand and let's close our worship, our gathered worship. Lord, what a faithful God you are. Lord, I come before your throne. Lord, I come before your throne of grace. I find rest in your presence and fullness of joy. In worship and wonder I behold your face, singing what a faithful God.
now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. And we've practised it and all God's people said? Amen. 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 Hallelujah.